like people have it worse, so I have to step it up. Like if that makes sense. Sometimes we meet people who are, even though we, even though I thought I was worse off, I met people that I love who I realized shouldn't even be here today. That I don't have it as bad, so I need to flip that switch and become a better, stronger, and just overall fighter of a person, I guess. What do you do when life pushes you? Seriously, I want you to ask yourself this question right now. What do you do when life pushes you? Do you succumb to the pressure and simply give in? Do you use it as an excuse or are you using that opposing force to your advantage to learn something about yourself, to truly learn something about what you're made of now and then use that knowledge to push yourself forward? Coming straight off of her first MMA fight and her first win, BJ Garceau has had a long road to the octagon. Now, when you listen to BJ by the sound of her voice, you would never expect her to be a fighter. But the more you learn about her, the more you'll realize that being a fighter presents itself in many forms. Diagnosed with spinal meningitis at four months old, BJ was left with complete hearing loss in one ear as a result. Now, growing up, she was always known as the quote-unquote sick kid, And at four years old, she was diagnosed with asthma. And then at 11, she was hit with a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. But even at a young age, nothing could slow her down. Now, this conversation is a masterclass on the path to becoming a warrior, regardless who you are. BJ and I talk about how experiencing significant adversity early on in life likely sets us up to have a fighter mindset. And we also discuss shaping our mentality with every experience to not look for the excuses or the easy path. BJ and I also talk about growing up in the 1980s, binge watching Stranger Things. We also cover BJ's love of music and our common bond of playing bass guitar and her love of none other than Jean-Claude Van Damme. But before we get into it with BJ today, today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Greater Than the apparel company with the huge mission of showing the world that we are all greater than the challenges we face. Visit imgreaterthan.com for their new lineup of hats, of t-shirts, and hoodies, and be sure to use the code BRAVEST at checkout and you'll get 10% off your entire order. And keep in mind, a portion of all profits go straight to support diabetes research. So visit imgreaterthan.com and use the code BRAVEST at checkout for 10% off your entire order. Also, if you're a fan of the show, you know that I'm always interested in looking for opportunities for myself, as well as for you guys, to take concepts from the show into the real world. So here's a really interesting opportunity to meet up with other type 1 diabetics and challenge yourself and also have some fun in the process. You're probably familiar with the nonprofit group Beyond Type 1, as well as Connected in Motion. Now, these two organizations have teamed up this summer to bring adults living with T1D three retreat weekends. Now, I want you to think diabetes camp, but with more free time, and as they say, some beers around the campfire. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the T1D community, get outside, you'll have a chance to recharge and refresh. Now, 2018 weekends are scheduled for dates in Maine, in Southern California, and Ontario, Canada, but they're going to be worth traveling for. So for more information and to, to figure out how you can register, head on over to beyondtype1.org forward slash slipstreams2018 and secure your spot. That's beyondtype1.org forward slash slipstreams2018 for all the info and to get one of these unique getaways on your calendar. All right, guys, let's get into my conversation with a super badass of a person, Miss BJ Garceau. Okay. Yeah. So, so look, as, as I said, I really appreciate the time that you're spending with me today to absolutely kind of... I have all afternoon for you. <laughs> That's great. It's good. I have, a, I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> good. So, um, you, you're, you're coming straight off of your first fight and not only your yeah. first fight, but also your first fight and your first win. 
Yeah. So how does that feel? Tell me about that. It's actually amazing. It's actually a lot better than I ever imagined because, you know, you can prepare yourself for anything. And I have a philosophy, you know, and I, this goes back to being diabetic and other health concerns that I've always had to be ready because the truth is in these health conditions and in my lifestyle, you never know what to expect. So I had a lot of pre-anxiety around my fight. I actually went through two fight camps before this one, and I was actually scheduled to fight back in August. And then I was supposed to fight back in November, which was going to be National Diabetes, which is, I should say, National Diabetes Awareness Month. And it's my birthday. So I was like, oh, I'm going to make a big thing out of it. And sorry to just be rambling on. But anyways, I went through the motions for about a half a year before actually getting into the cage. So but stepping into it, I expected to give my best. And I guess I wasn't planning on the win, if that makes sense. It was more I was going in there to fight prove to the world that I could take the steps to get in there and just fight my ass off the best I could. Um, and I honestly, if you, if anyone's ever seen the fight video, I'm congratulating my opponent, Sarah, because I actually thought she won. So, so yeah, it, it threw me back in a good way. It's really interesting because I don't watch a ton of MMA, but the fights that I have watched, it's, it's much more civilized than most people would expect. And the reason why I say that is yes, it's brutal. There's fighting, Mm -hmm. Uh, at times there's blood, there's broken bones, broken noses, things like that. But what I've always seen, at least the the fights that I've seen is the fighters at the end of the fight are super congratulatory toward each other. They're hugging each other and it's, it's the fights over life goes on. It's not as if there's this kind of this rumble that happens after the fight. It's very, very civilized in that respect. Right. Right. And the reason behind that, too, because I'm not going to lie when I first because I actually have a history, too. I've worked as a bouncer in a bar and I actually have a degree in mental health with a minor in addiction studies. Um, so I've had to deal with a lot up in new England and up in Maine primarily. Um, I've worked in several methadone clinics where I've actually had to get in fights or stop fights or things like that. And they never ended as civil (laughs) as they do in the gym. And I think what comes to it is that we all know what our opponents and what their coaches have to go through to get into that cage. And we see each other a lot too. Um, up here in Maine, MMA, it's it's a really small, tight community. Actually, the girl I fought against, um, we've actually cross-trained together. So her and I have been um, partners in some training classes. So we were friends prior to getting into this cage. Um, And the one thing about it is you give your all in there. And so you have nothing but respect to the person who's willing to step in there and, you know, give their all and willing to do that and willing to even try to knock you out because you're trying to knock them out. And the fact that you both have the guts to get in there you can, you have to shake their hand, you know, it's just such a common respect to even get brave enough to step in that octagon. So, yeah. so yeah, we come, we come out closer than we do than most people expect. It's actually a very civil sport. So you, so you said you were, you're actually friends with the person that you fought? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Cause like I was speaking before too, I had a fight set in August and like, and each time I talk about this, like for me, and especially being a type one diabetic and even my age, I'm 35. You don't even hear of a lot of people getting into the ring in their 30s, mostly 20s and whatnot. But anywho, so for me getting in there, it was going to be in my hometown back in August. So I went through a fight camp, which is exhausting. And my opponent, we didn't find the opponent what it was or either that they backed out. I don't remember. Um, so anyways, we're trying to think of where I was going with this. Um, so you guys are so friends. Sarah, yeah. yeah, so Sarah came in. Well, the this last fight um, on this February card... It, my my original opponent backed out. So Sarah, <laughs> the girl I fought, she actually jumped in with two weeks' notice um, and took this fight on. So I've had two or three girls back out of fighting me. And then Sarah just willingly, because she knows who I am, um, and she shared with me too, she actually has some family members with type 1 diabetes because I had already launched my campaign meeting. Like I was just, I'm raising money for the JDRF um, and things like that. So she willingly just stepped up. But prior to that, both of our gyms were, we call them um, brother gyms or brother and sister gyms, so to speak, meaning if they're ever traveling traveling up here to Bangor, they can train at our gym for free and they can work with us. Or if we're ever traveling down there, they open their doors to all our members. So yeah, so I knew Sarah beforehand and she just willingly took it on. She's really supportive of the type one um, diabetes foundations and things like that and the support. And uh, a lot of people were super, super supportive of just getting me in there. Yeah, so congratulations on that, and, and congratulations yeah. also on on the fact that, you, as you said, you, you use it as a platform 
to not only raise awareness regarding diabetes, but also you raised quite a bit of money uh, for, yeah. for JDRF as well. So congratulations and thank you for yeah. doing that. Um, yeah, we haven't um, submitted our check yet because I also started um, selling hoodies and sweatpants and things like that. And our women's team has exploded. I've been a member of Young's MMA and that's my home gym. So shout out to everyone at Young's. Um, <laughs> who's been nothing but supportive, um, my coaches, my teammates and whatnot. But so anyways, I started selling hoodies and I had this lit lab, uh, label from my walkout song from a bikini kill song. And there's an older band called the rebel girl. So anyways, all the money from the hoodies and stuff, all the made off it are going towards the JDRF, but I actually sold more than I can keep on the shelves. So That's I haven't awesome. had a chance to submit my money yet. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to submit it, but we're, we're over $1,300 so far. That's great. Um, that's yeah. Great. Yeah. So, and one reason behind that too is just the government. And I know we had a scare there with a the special diabetes programming and, you know, the change of Congress. So we don't have to talk about politics or anything like that, but you know, any little bit helps us. No doubt. And look, you, this, this is a, a free, a free microphone, so you can feel free to talk about whatever <laughs> you want to, but may, maybe what we can do is this, there's so much interesting stuff that as I was starting to learn a little bit about you and as you're talking more, there's so much interesting stuff that I really want to get into, but I'd love to kind of just turn back the hands of time just a little bit, kind of learn from where, about where you're from originally and, then, and kind of like what, what you were like as a kid. And I know I asked this question of, of the majority of my guests, but I think that childhood kind of defines us as we go through life and it kind of makes us into who we are. So maybe you can kind of touch upon where you grew up, what you were like as a kid, what was important to you. Yeah, okay. Um, and I have a very um, interesting background like you and I talked about a little bit before the mics were on. So, um, well, I actually, I'm from Maine. For those of you who don't know that, I'm uh, currently living in central Maine, um, the city of Bangor. And I grew up about a half hour north of Maine, uh, Bangor here in a little town called Greenbush, which I can't think of a more Maine sounding town. So, yeah. um, very, very small. And again, I grew up in the 80s. So this was before the internet and stuff like that, where we, if anyone's a fan of Stranger Things, one of my favorite shows, you know, you see the kids riding bikes to each other's houses and, and whatnot. And that's what we did. Like, I remember cassettes. I remember when CDs first came out. So um, it's amazing it when very... that, sh when that show first came out, I didn't watch it when it first came out, but I, oh, of course, so I'm, good. like everybody else, I've been binging it. And I have yeah. to tell you, it's I, I'm a product of the 80s also, although I was born in the 70s. I grew up in yeah. the 80s. And it's just remarkable to me how well that show nailed it. So, oh, they nailed it. The music, oh, and the music is because music's always been a huge part of my life as well, too. Just the music, the way the kids interact, the video games, to the driving around, to, oh, man, I absolutely love that show. To the style. Such a great yeah. show, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you. No, but... no, no, I'm just like, I mean, I use it as an example. So pretty much like in my growing up, we did a lot of those things. Like you knew where all of our friends were because of the bikes outside and so forth. So, but we grew up in a very small town, or I grew up, I have two older brothers, um, a mom and dad, um, which I was one of those odd children. My parents were still married um, all through all through my um, childhood. And I'm the youngest. Um, and like I had shared with you, um, I was... I was diagnosed with spinal meningitis when I was four months old. So for me, I've always been on medicine. So for growing up for me, I've always had a careful eye on me. Like I was actually held inside like during my, I was always known as a sick kid growing up. And I don't know the best way to put that. Like I look healthy on the outside, but inside my body just had, was fighting itself. So I do, I don't know if it was spinal meningitis or whatnot, but around the age of four, I got diagnosed with asthma. And of course, like I said, growing up in the 80s, smoking was very popular. And both of my parents were heavy smokers. Um, I got diagnosed with asthma, but I had it so severe, I actually was on nebulizer treatment. So, <laughs> so when I was in kindergarten, I would have to carry a nebulizer, one of those big 80s machines. Do you know what I'm talking about yeah, when I say course. that? Like the mass with the smoke and whatnot. Um, so I had that and I used to have to take actually a break from class once or twice a day to go get nebulizer treatments. So, and here's the thing though, on top of that, I played sports and like I said, I was sick. I played sports, um, rode my bike, da, da, da. I mean, I was a pretty normal kid other than my health concerns. And then I'm trying to think I entered middle school. I was right around age 11 um, and I played farm league and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe my life. You know, I had two older brothers and we did typical things. Like I was a little girl, but we, I was more of a tomboy. 
Um, I played farm league and baseball growing up, lots of basketball. Um, I always had a fast acting inhaler in one hand, a nebulizer hiding out in the back of my mom's car. Um, but my parents tried to make it as normal as possible do you for think, me as they could. Do you think you had something to prove because you, you were faced yeah. with all these kind of these adversities very, very, from four months on, you're, you're faced with these crazy adversities. Yeah. Um, and I was in and out of hospitals all the time, whether for asthma or just checkups with, because I, because of the spinal meningitis, I actually left me with permanent hearing loss on my right side. Um, so I lost all of my hearing on my right side meeting and I, I wasn't wearing hearing aids. I mean, I was just so self-conscious, but yeah, I felt like I had to prove the world. I was even normal, which was a struggle every day. It's interesting because, um, I, I my older son was a preemie. He was uh, 29 weeker. So he was born, he was born two pounds, 11 ounces. Oh, and wow. what I've always, uh, realized about him, uh, from the time that we were in the NICU with him for, for over two months is that he's probably going to be the hardest headed fighter out there <laughs> just because that's just now it's, it's part of his nature. And while he is a very kind of mild mannered and, and I don't know you very well, you sound very mm -hmm. kind of mild mannered to, to a certain extent, but there's probably a part of you that just doesn't let anything take advantage of you because no. you feel like you have to kind of jump over, over hurdles just that are thrown in front of you. And that's how he is as well. It's like, he's very kind of quiet until you push to a certain, ex to a certain point where he feels like yep. he has to prove something and it's just like a caged animal. <laughs> and how's he, how's he doing today? Is he still strong headed? Is he still, He's, is he, is he what you expected him to be from such a fighting age, young fighting age? That's a really good question. I don't know if I had any massive expectations except the fact that I was just happy. And I, I think it, I think what things like that teach you is that life is massively fragile and that you have to work hard for things that matter. Yes. Um, and he is a, as I said, a very, very laid back kid. He's now almost 16. He's six feet tall. He's very, very strong. Yeah. You, would, you would never know that he was a preemie. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that because of those early experiences at the very beginning of his life, that definitely shapes his mentality. Um, yeah, absolutely. And people think that stuff doesn't stick with you. Like, I mean, like when I was saying too, even my stay in the NICU, I can't remember anything about it, but I know that I had to have gone to get, I had to have gone through something to get me to where I am today to not give up. You know, yeah, I think there's a certain physical memory. It, it, there's yeah. mental memory too, but your bo our bodies remember um, the pain uh, yeah. that we went through, um, and it doesn't go anywhere. It's there. Uh, it just manifests itself in different ways. I think throughout the course of our lives, um, and yeah, then on top absolutely. of that, you had two older brothers who probably were were unkind at times. I'm guessing. <laughs> They were actually, yeah. But I had an oldest brother. He's about eight years older than me. And I'm just even thinking, you know, here I am, even at 11, if he's 18, you know, any 18 year old boy is going to be busy being a high school senior sure. and they don't want to hang out with their geeky, asthmatic, diabetic, <laughs> hard of hearing <laughs> little sister. And it's just amazing to me even see how times have changed because I'm actually, I'm trying to think of a way to say this because um, I'm very, very social. Um, and very involved and whatnot. It's actually reversed because like, you know, my brothers may have been a little bit cooler in middle school or whatnot. And then now as an adult, just through fighting and through my healthcare studies and, and whatever, it's like, oh, my brothers are like, that's my sister. That's my sister. That's my sister. You know, it's almost like they're showing me off now. It's just interesting to see how oh, times su change. Super proud of you. Clearly there's a yeah. lot to be proud of there. That's amazing. Yeah. So and just to go back, well, just to kind of, sorry to cut you off. I'm no, thinking about what you said too, about you know, like how feeling like you need to either suppress or like to prove more you know, where you were saying that. It's just amazing to me because even someone, and I'm just going to go back to the health concerns, we take so much just to be normal. You know what I mean? Sure. And you know, this being a type one, like even today, like I had practice this morning, I woke up um, and I tested my blood sugar and it was 47. And I was like, okay, well, I can't drive for at least 15 minutes until I test my blood sugar and it made me late for practice. And it's just like these little things in life. You know what I mean? That like we have to wake up, test our blood and that can even decide if we drive a car or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, and that's just a normal behavior. Just getting to practice can be a struggle. Yeah. It's amazing. And then just getting there to like, and then have your team look at you like, okay, so are you going to like practice? Are you going to do this? And then for you to just, cause I mean, I stabilized obviously, sure. you know, it's just like, no, no, I'm cool. I'm cool. Let's go in. Let's go in. And they would have been understanding every, uh, any way you look at it, but it just takes so much 
to be normal. So for us to do anything a little bit out of the ordinary, it's just so, it's amazing. Like yeah. my mind, I'm still, I'm still on a high just from, from all the winning and all the publicity we've gotten from it. So no doubt. And it's interesting because I, and I don't know the exact statistic, but I, I don't know if you know the artist Appleton, he's a type one artist and he's actually been type one since childhood as well. And he, mm. he integrates, um, his, his, his type one into all of his art and, He's an amazing guy. I interviewed him for the podcast a while back, and he, I don't remember the statistic exactly, but he was talking about the amount of decisions that the normal person has to make every day versus the amount of decisions that the person with type 1 diabetes has to make every single day. Yeah. And it's exponentially larger for the person who's type 1 when we don't even realize it half the time because it's just kind of mm -hmm. our, our normal day to day. Um, yeah. but it is, it's, it's exhausting at times and, and it does, um, I, I wouldn't say it slows us down because it, it, I don't think anything has the ability to slow you down. It just makes you mindful yeah. of, of what you can do at certain periods of time, I think. Right. Um, so what, what as a kid held your attention for the longest, what were you most interested in? Um, music. I've always been a huge music fan and I know being, um, hard of hearing that I don't know if it's because actually when I was first died, when I was in the NICU, and this was back in 82. Um, they actually thought I was completely deaf. So, which is the weirdest thing. And then, you know, after, admittedly, you know, I don't know if someone made some noises or something and I started getting attention on my left side. I've just been really appreciative of the gift of sound yeah. and music. And when I, like I was saying too, growing up, um, and I play bass, um, I play drums very poorly. <laughs> I can play a little bit of guitar, but um, music has always been there in a way that no one else has. And I don't know the best way to describe that. Um, in Maine, it gets very, very cold up here. And I used to have to stay in for recess because I was asthmatic and cold would bother, bother me like when I was in grade school and whatnot. And I just remember looking out the windows, watching all my friends play. And I think some of them might've been jealous because I was inside warm, but I just remember thinking how I wish I was out there with them and all I had was headphones sitting with me in a classroom while everyone else was having fun. And that happened to me at least a couple of times a week growing up, just watching my friends in jealousy. So anyways, my most common interest was music, and it's still that way. I've been to more concerts um, and live performances and things like that than I have anything else in my life. It's just something that makes me feel whole and connected, I guess, in one way. I agree. And then I, sports, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think music is so, so important, and, and it touches everybody's life um, Absolutely. in one way or, or another. So, so that's one other thing we have in common. I played bass when I was growing up. Um, I played bass in high, throughout middle school and high school yeah. in, a, in a hardcore band. Um, Did you actually? Mine was a hardcore band, too, because I was really into the emo screamo. Uh, um, music and um, hardcore, like a um, mad ball and like all these other ones too. And plus it was easy. And I, this is no offense because I used to play it too. I found it to be easier to play a little bit. <laughs> I agree with you. There's only four, there's only four notes basically for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And you can slap, you can pick, you can do whatever you need to do. It's like, yes, that's right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, um, so mad ball came out, um, kind of towards the tail end of my, my hardcore days. Um, but bands like, Gorilla Biscuits and Chrome yes. Eggs and, yep. you know, Youth of and Today. A popular one named Bane um, up here in New England, too, we used to do, but they came out around the same time Madball and yeah. whatnot came out. But, it's, yeah. it's interesting because New England, like Connecticut had a big hardcore scene. Uh, there was a little bit out of Boston. I think there was like Slapshot was a band up in Boston. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they had this movement and all that stuff. And Were you straight edge, too? Um. I think in middle school, I guess just by default, I was straight edge. Yeah, well, by and but and for those, you know, straight edge means that you're just completely clean of any uh, substance, anything from caffeine to tobacco to alcohol. You're you're completely clean. And yeah, so, and that was heavy in the punk hardcore scene for when I was growing up. Yeah, typically you can identify anyone who was straight edge by an X on their hands. They mark. Yeah, themselves. exactly. And they were, and they they're almost like the vegans or the vegetarians of the world. They'll let you know. That was, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. So, and, and, and then the, the whole skate thing came out for me, but, um, yep. so, so, so the music play, played and continues to play a very important part in your role. And one other thing that I learned about you that had a really important, uh, played an important role earlier in life is, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> yeah. Actually me and my coach were talking about him today because, um, I uh, was watching a show called, and sorry to go back to my uh, Black Mirror, which is like the sci-fi retro thing. And we were just talking about um, bad 
directing or before, you know, you know, like the special effects came out in any who, yeah, we were talking about Jean-Claude Van Damme and just how he wasn't a great actor, but he sure knew how to kick and he sure was super popular in the early nineties, like late eighties. Like, yeah, my dad was obsessed. So I get to watch him a lot. And plus being a younger girl, I was like, Oh, he's cute. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. I think back, back then there was, it was between Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Steven Seagal was another mm-hmm. one. Which was um, another uh, teammate's favorite, just because they, they explained uh, their love for Steven Seagal because he's so calm. <laughs> he's very zen. You know he, he's very yeah, zen. He's very, yeah. that's, what, that's exactly how they said it. They said he's very zen. Yeah. So you had Jean-Claude Van Damme, you had Steven Seagal, and then Schwarzenegger and Stallone were around that same time. And, yeah. and, uh, Norris there. Chuck Norris oh, was Chuck Norris was a little somewhere. earlier, too. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so how, let's explore kind of your entry into the world of MMA for, for a bit. And I, I want you to walk us through the timeline because, you know, most people might understand what MMA is on the surface, mm-hmm. um, but they don't understand kind of like this long kind of trajectory that it takes and, tr- and types of training that are involved because it's not one form of martial arts. It's called MMA no. because it's mixed martial arts. And a lot of it yeah. is based, uh, from what I understand, in kind of Brazilian jiu-jitsu plays a big role in there, but... Yeah, big time. It's it's that's not just it. So maybe you can kind of walk us a little bit. Maybe first start off by kind of where the attraction to the sport and and the sport yeah. of fighting came from, and then kind of walk us through to some of the things that you've been trained in. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, what happened was, and I'm going to go back to my um, diet. I'm just going to give a little story. I kind of had a rough year in 2014. Um, I had lost my father to leukemia. And my grandmother um, passed away a couple months later. And these, and my dad and my grandmother were two very, very influential, influential people in my life. Um, they were there all the time. Um, anyway, with that being said, I knew I had to make some changes in my life. And that life wasn't a promise, so to speak. And I know having diabetes and other health concerns that, you know, we know life is a promise. But to actually see two people I care about no longer be around, I knew I had to make some health care changes. So, um I was actually not on the insulin pump until about three, three and a half years ago. And I met my wife um, and she told me a bit of her history and she was actually a premature baby too. And she just told me some traumatic events and I was like, I need to get help. You know, have you ever met someone and you're like, I need to get better for them? Oh, of course. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and like uh, that little, per- like the person who inspires you, like I need to be better. And I was heavier so I um, was having extreme hypos, and my wife had never dated a diabetic, and she was having a hard time with me having these hypos, so meaning like my, I couldn't detect my blood sugars being low anymore. Um, so she encouraged me to go see a specialist, which I had taken a break from, so I was just working with my primary care doctor. I think I was also struggling with some depression after losing my dad um, and my grandmother that I just kind of care of myself. I was drinking and so forth. And wife, I just saw the struggle and the loss on my wife's uh, face. And we actually weren't married yet. So I went to the doctor's office, talked to my specialist who I'm still working with. And she said, you need to get on the continued glucose monitoring system now. She's like, or we don't think you're going to live in the next couple of years. And I was like, is that bad? And she's like, yeah, because what had happened is, um, I started dropping things. So she, I would, she was under the impression I was starting to have neurological damage because my blood sugars were dropping so low. Sure. And so I was like, Oh my God. So anyway, and this is all, I promise you, this is all going to get to the MMA. No, it's all good. <laughs> so, Take your time. Um, so what had happened was, and one reason I had never really run, um, was because I, my blood sugars were all over the place. Um, so I got on the CGM with the insulin pump and it saved my life. It, it was, it saved my life. I can't go on about how important these uh, scientific and um, robotic and all these other breakthroughs are for type one diabetics. Anyway, so I, now that I could keep an eye on my blood sugar, I decided to just pick up running. And I remember the first mile I ran, it took me 13 minutes to run my first mile. Cause I was about 25 pounds heavier than I am now. And, um, what, and, and, and so, and then I started watching the walking dead which I don't know if anyone else is familiar with The Walking Dead. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and I realized I would not be able to even run to the pharmacy if the world was ending to go see if I could get insulin. Huh. So that just from watching The Walking Dead and from the inspiration of my wife and losing these family members, I decided to get in shape for the simple fact of survival. 
So I started running and then I noticed um, I lost about 10, 15 pounds. I was like, oh, wow, this feels good. And I started to notice a little bit of muscle. Um, and then it turns out Young's MMA was just up the street from my apartment at the time. And my wife was working at a local coffee shop and a couple of the guys came down um, and they were actually hitting on her, which is funny. <laughs> it's actually funny. And we became, me and the guys became really good friends. Um, my wife came home with this pamphlet and she's like, Hey, she goes, I know that you're really interested in fighting and, you know, surviving the end of the world. She's like, do you want to get, do you want to try some MMA? And she's a black belt in Taekwondo. So I was like, yeah, sure. I'll go up and try it. So anyways, with the long story being said, short, uh, making a short story long, I just decided from my wife's word of mouth and to go on top of my running and a little bit of weightlifting I did, I said, okay, I'll try some MMA. And then I started doing fitness classes, which eventually led to kickboxing classes, which eventually led to becoming friends with some of the teammates. And then we didn't have a lot of female fighters at the time. Um, my coach was kind of keeping an eye on me. I didn't notice that he actually saw a spark in me to do it. And then from kickboxing classes, I actually entered a kickboxing competition and was very successful. Um, and this was actually another, um, benefit thing where all the proceeds went to veterans and my father was ex-marine. So I did that for him. Um, and then entered a jujitsu tournament. And then my coach approached me last summer after practicing for about two years and asked me if I wanted to enter the octagon. So amazing. So yeah, took a lot of, a lot of steps together though. Like I said, I was doing fitness, MMA fitness classes, which aren't your typical like Les Mills or anything like that. Like you have to do push ups, like, um, hit a punching bag for, you know, three minutes straight with kicks and things like that. And you don't realize how exhausting it is to actually get in a fight. <laughs> like if you watch the walking dead and like watch these, like, like fighting a swarm of zombies or people, that guy's going to be tired. Sure. <laughs> fighting is exhausting. It's a whole new world. It, there's, there's no doubt. It's really interesting though, because the, the, the way that most people will see, see you in your fight, the beginning of February this is your first kind of official fight in, in an yeah. MMA match. You, you're winning it. But what they don't understand is that you had to start somewhere. And everybody sees the, the success components, right? They see yeah. the Instagram photos. They see the posts online. They see the coaches out there that look ripped. But what they don't understand right. is that everybody has to start somewhere. And your somewhere was basically – being motivated by someone who you, who you cared about and who cared about you mm -hmm. and also coming from a place of loss, um, yeah. saying, I need to, I need to do better for myself. Um, and I need to get out of that depression I was in too, because I mean, if I wouldn't have had these physical outlets, I don't know what I would have done with that anger. That's, it's so important because what, what the, the mental side of things is something that I definitely want to touch upon with you also. But what, mm -hmm. what, what I didn't realize years ago and, and I've had some level of physical activity in my life for my entire life, but when I don't work out and when I don't get some sort of physical activity, I slip into this crazy mood where <laughs> me too, it's, me too. It's, I'm, I'm angry. I'm, I'm not happy. Yeah. And, and I don't realize it until I just get my rear end moving again. And when I yeah. do, it's like, oh my God, there's the endorphins. There's everything what, that I needed, right? What do you do for working out? If you don't mind me asking, what do you do for that physical exercise what do you is there anything in particular you really that really helps you with your blood sugars and your mental health really really good question i'm i'm a big fan of experimentation um mm -hmm. and have I you like, tried MMA? i have not i have not that's no. one thing i have not done but i'm probably gonna have to take i'm guessing after this conversation i'm gonna have to take a ride up to maine um, <laughs> yeah please do you're welcome anytime we'd love to have you i appreciate that so what do i do um it depends i go through seasons so weight weight training has always been a part of my life since i'm a kid um running has become a part of my life over the past say five years i hate mm -hmm. i said this before i can't stand running but i've run half marathons i run you know, the obstacle course races. And it's simply just yep. because I like to get different challenges. Um, yeah, I'm uh, doing my first half marathon this year. So it's, it's such a great experience and it just gives you some, another goal to work yeah. towards. So I, I mix it up, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll go in, I'll go through seasons, but a lot of my, my training has to do with, um, you know, resistance training, running body mm -hmm. weight type stuff. Um, and, you know, from a mental perspective, meditation has played a huge role in my life for well over 20 years at this point. Any yoga or anything involved with that? I would love to actually have yoga 
become a larger part of my life because I feel too. That too. There's, there's so much of a benefit, not only from a mindset perspective, but just uh, the, the thing that I realize. my, my wife does Pilates and yoga. And what I realize yeah. is that anyone who does yoga happens to be one of the strongest people out there. Isn't it amazing? It's remarkable. How, yeah. I have friends who are yoga instructors and, and this is nothing disrespectful towards them. And I'm just going to speak on, you know, when you look at someone like, and I'm only going to speak on my half, you, you can tell if you were to see me with like a short sleeve shirt on, you could tell I lift things up. Like <laughs> you can tell I have some physical muscle there when sure. I'm in the, in my friends who are the yoga instructors, they are the most soft spoken, very just like, Hey, you want to go for a hike? <laughs> you know, like, like very things, but they are strong. Very strong. I, I can't get over the strength. And like, I'm just going, like, if I was to look at them, I think they would actually win in a fight versus me. <laughs> like, you never yoga, know. Yoga, no, they're, they're, they, and they have the endurance too, that I am so jealous of the capability to breathe and the endurance and stuff. I, I'm yoga, yoga people intimidate me. <laughs> They're strong. I, I agree with you. And, you know, I think for me, what I've come to, uh, you get to know your body over time. And although your body mm-hmm. changes, at least we think we do. You think you do. <laughs> I have that's, to say that. Yeah. That's a great point is we think we know our bodies. But what I found is that if I don't have some level of kind of weight training, resistance training, that my blood sugars have a tendency to kind of trend upward because I think mm-hmm. when, when you, and sometimes they trend upward because of the weight training as well. It really depends yep. on how intense the 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 the, the, uh, the training session is. But you know, are you I think, a pump user? I'm sorry. Are you a pump user? Do I you am. do the CGM and the pump have, and things like that? I do have a CGM. I do not have a pump. No. So you do. And again, sorry to. I'm not trying to veer too far away because I've heard of other people doing that. So you do insulin shots and then keep a CGM in you. That's correct. Yeah, the CGM okay. the CGM changed my mentality completely. And if you don't mind me asking, you have that hooked up to a phone or an, uh, a watch or? Uh, it's on my iPhone. That's awesome. And yeah. not, sorry, I just don't, like I said too, I'm up here in Maine and um, I probably only know physically four of people with a pump. So so I'm curious to always hear about other people's lifestyles. So Yeah, no, by, hmm. by all means, it's, it's been. That's actually uh, pretty cool. I never C- thought about doing it that way. The CGM that I have, uh, I've had it for about three or four years and yeah. at, at minimum it helps me sleep better at night. And yeah. that's, that's worth its weight in gold. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry to be, to be off topic. I've just uh, no. heard of a very few people who don't use the CGM with, without the pump. And, uh, I just was curious on how that, how that worked out for you. No, it's, it's so far, so far it's been, it's been a lifesaver for me just from a, a yeah. mentality perspective and just kind of letting go of, of certain stressors, uh, mm-hmm. especially sleeping through a night. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a lifesaver. Now, now, one thing that, that that I wanted to ask you because we've we've been talking quite a bit about the amount of energy and time that that you invest in training and getting prepared for fights, et cetera. But that's not your day job. That's not what's paying your bills no. necessarily. No. So, so you're you're you are in healthcare world as well. But the the thing that I'm really interested in, and also you talked about being you know a mental health professional dealing mm-hmm. with people who have substance abuse issues. So it's not a, an, an easy job that you've had throughout the course of your career. No. So there's oftentimes, there's the excuse, right? The excuse that I hear a lot of times is, and it, it could be someone with type one or without type one. It doesn't have to be a diabetes related excuse, but I'm too busy. I'm too overscheduled. I'm too exhausted to train, mm-hmm. et cetera, et yep. cetera, et cetera. So what are your thoughts on somebody who says that? Well, here's my thing, and I can't speak for everybody, and I am here I am giving myself all these diagnoses. I actually am more exhausted not training. And like you said, um, your mental health, you may feel like you're angry or things like that. It's actually more physical. It's more exhausting on my body to have depression than it is to be tired from running, if that makes any sense. Sure. Because I, I, I don't know if I'm addicted to um, endorphins. I don't know if it's just like I love the rush and the fact that – and I've also been diagnosed with ADHD. Like I'm just a hyper person in general. Um, but for people who don't have the excuse, they just need to stop making excuses and get out there and try it. And I don't know the best way to say that because trust me, even this morning when my blood sugar was low, I was like, I should probably just stay home. But I know that I wouldn't even be – even this interview, like I know once I start this trend of being like, oh, I don't want to practice, that's going to set the pace for my entire day. Like, and this is no offense to you, but it means like, I've been like, oh, I have to, I'm going to do that podcast and then, oh, I have to go to work instead of, okay, I'm going to go to practice. Okay. I'm going to do this. And like, it helps my mood out just doing it. And like, so if I had a daily list, I know I would be crossing that stuff off. 
does that make any sense? 100%. Like if I set if I set these little goals, it's going to set my pace for the rest of the day. So, and I, yeah, yeah, no, it makes absolute sense, and and it it does talk to to the mindset of of a fighter as well. It's not not only a physical fighter, but a person who fights in life. Um, right. It's it's how who who what differentiates people is how do people you know, just kind of succumb to that 40, that blood sugar reading of 47 mm-hmm. and say, you know what, it's a really, it is a really easy excuse to just kind of sit back and not do something. And it's also, and I've learned this growing up too, and like you said too, um, we're, we're probably not far off from the same age. I've had diabetes since 93. And people, when people see me and they know I'm a diabetic, and diabetes is horrible, don't get me wrong, by all means, I'm not trying to play it off, I'm not trying to say this. Um, because I'm a very self-sufficient person, meaning that I take care of my blood sugars. Like I, I've always had this, um, respect, but when people see me with a 47, they're the ones who are like, BJ, you need to sit down. We, we need to hurl you up in a blanket, give you a juice box, which, and, and I love the people who do that, but there's actually been incurred. Like I even know, like, let's say I had a test coming up and this isn't caution for any kids. Don't use this as an excuse. Oh, my blood sugar's off. <laughs> I don't think I could take my test train now, which I may have set myself up to just use that as an excuse. You know what I mean? Sure. Like I was someone who totally took advantage of these uh, diseases or or my diabetes or whatnot as a way to get out of things. And I and I hate to say it. So anyway, with that being said, you just have to get over it. Like I have to. I had to teach myself as I got older, and I decided to be healthier. I need to take care of my mental health and just do it. Like that would like with that 47, I could have sat home, but I just rechecked it 15 minutes later. I had a cup of coffee with some creamer and it was perfect. So I just hit the road, went to the gym and I'm so happy I did. Yeah. I think, that, I, I think that if we look for an excuse in any aspect of our lives, we're, we're likely to find the excuse. There's always oh, a reason. There's not always to an excuse. Yeah. It's too cold though. It's, um, you know, whether, um, I, I didn't have any clean shorts or, you know, blood sugar or co- I didn't have my coffee. It's amazing. And one other thing I want to throw in there too, is it's not just me at the gym. I have a whole team. Like I, you know, when I went in there this morning, I had two other girls that really could use my help and I need their help. So, and I mean this on my job too. Um, cause I actually work in sterile processing now up at the hospital, meaning I work with surgical equipment um, and make sure surgical equipment's clean, ready, disinfected, and prepared before surgical cases. Um, meaning Medtronic too, which is super cool. But anyways, if I if I use these excuses, I'm hurting patients at the hospital who have surgeries. I'm hurting coworkers who need that extra body there to help them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So by me coming up with these excuses, I'm not going to let diabetes be an excuse. If anything, it's just going to motivate me to be better and take better care of myself and get these things done because it's not just about me anymore. It's about my wife. It's about my family. It's about my job and it's about my team. So, and I have MMA to thank for that too because my coaches have sat me down. They're like, we're a family. Like, if you're not here, someone else is not going to benefit with what you have to bring in. You're not going to be able to benefit what they have to offer you by missing a day. I, I love so, that. I love that because it's it's yeah. about it's about taking care of what you need to take care of, not only for yourself but for everyone else around you. Yeah, um, and so if anyone's listening to this, I hope they hear it that yes, diabetes is serious, but watch it. Make sure you can maintain it because, and that's one thing. Being someone who's had a disease, and I know a lot of tension has been on me. I actually read a great article, um, something about the invisible family member about diabetes always being there at the dinner table and on vacations and da da da. But we also have to remember people need us too. That we are there, like, you know, you have kids, that you know you have to take care of yourself in order for your kids. You know? That's like right. the world's not just about us anymore. Or and again I'm saying this as someone who was brought up like poor BJ, poor BJ. But it's not just about myself and motivate myself and do these things for other people. Exactly. You know, it's it's. I'm curious to understand if if you think that's because of the. I'll, let me set up this question a little differently because yeah, I had um I have a, a friend who I interviewed um on the podcast way back when her name is Anne Marie Saccarado and she's actually a three, that's a fancy name yeah <laughs> uh and she's a three time WBC lightweight world champion. Oh, that's um, awesome. And she, if anyone uh, has not listened to the episode, it's episode 15 on the podcast. I'll put awesome. a link I'll to that. Awesome, I'll have to that. check it out. Yeah, I'll put yeah. a link to that in the show notes also. But it's, Yeah, please do. Her story is not all that dissimilar to yours. And it seems like that 
you know, based on that conversation I had with her, that she had this kind of natural fighting spirit that was kind of dormant in her for, for since childhood to a certain extent. Um, but I, I feel, and I'm not even sure me, this is why I'm going to ask this question. I don't know if that can be taught. Um, yeah. so, so it, this kind of dovetails with this concept of, okay, using excuses, right? It's like, mm-hmm. so can, can we actually rewire ourselves to have that fighting spirit because you're demonstrating it. And although you said earlier in your life that you kind of had this woe is me type of mentality to a certain yeah. extent, there was still this kind of fighter inside of you. So do you think that we can rewire ourselves to become more of a fighter? Absolutely. I think so. Um, and I'm not sure exactly if it was meeting my wife that made my attitude change because I guess for me growing up and I came from a middle, like an upper middle class family. I never went without food. I went to all, like I said, my, I love my family and my parents and my brothers took care of me the very best way they could. And also I was dealing with my sexuality. Um, I was in the nineties knowing I was, uh, knowing I was gay. Um, and I, tried to come out to my family at one point too, and they shunned away from that. So here I am, this diabetic, you know, becoming out in the gay in the nineties. And so I had a lot of things dealing with me and I guess I felt like poor me, poor me, poor me. And also I didn't have the social media and I didn't have the support systems that we do now. Um, and so anyways, with that being said, and then, like I said, I thought my world was horrid when in fact it wasn't. And then I met my wife who had who has just a horrific life story, which I'm not going to get into. And I was like, Oh my God, like people have it worse. So I have to step it up. Like if that makes sense. Sometimes we meet people who are, even though we, even though I thought I was worse off, I met people that I love who I realized shouldn't even be here today that I don't have it as bad. So I need to flip that switch and become a better, stronger and just overall fighter of a person, I guess. Yeah, this this definitely perspective plays a huge role in yeah. in our mindset, um, and and unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of times we're not really ex- and look, I, I don't want necessarily tragedy to be a part of my life all the time. That's not what I'm saying right. here, but I do right. think that we need to expose ourselves to significant adversity here and there just to kind of keep yeah. ourselves in check. Absolutely, I'm guessing 100%. that's what you get. I'm guessing that's what you get from MMA as well, because you are putting yourself through potential tragedy. Every time you yeah. step in that ring. Oh, every time. And you, you won't believe it. Like I've seen people, um, a friend of mine, she's another girl. Um, hi, hi, Katie. She was, uh, she's a teammate of mine who was uh, on there and she actually got her nose broken. And like, she, you know, she had never been in a world of, I guess, that much. Because even though we practice, we don't look to like, fa- you know, re- t- knock people out when we're at practice. We're not looking to, you know, totally conquer our teammates and whatnot. It's more skills and whatnot. Um, however... Yeah, we go through these things. In MMA, you know, we're training for these horrific outcomes. Like, you want to knock a person out. You want to try to break people's arms. You want to do, you know, to have total physical control in these situations. And when we're in there, you know, we have to try to come with these outcomes. And it's very, it's very, very, very difficult sport. Um, I'm trying to think of where I'm rambling on here. What was the question again? <laughs> no, no, but look, the, the reality is that you're, you're going into this ring and it's very oh, yeah. uncertain in times yeah. and you're putting yourself in a position where you're, you teeter on the edge of, of tragedy potentially every time, yeah. whether it's hurting yourself, getting your health, self hurt or mm-hmm. actually in, in inflicting some sort of pain or hurt on your opponent. Yeah. Um, which, and it's just like gladiator. Think about it. Like yeah. if you go, you get locked in a cage with someone else to cause physical harm to them. So it's it's going to be traumatic regardless. Yeah. And yeah. of course, walking away either as a winner or a loser, there's some uh, expectations and weight that goes with that as well. Sure. Sure. Now, yeah. now, for your recent fight, you fought at what was considered the straw weight level. Now, yep. I, I had never heard this before. So what does it mean? What does that mean exactly when it comes to your weight at a straw weight? Well, what had happened originally is my original po- opponent and I, who um, she had backed out, we were scheduled to fight at 115. And that's um, straw weight, very light. That's the lowest we go, um, to my understanding, anyway, um, in women's MMA. Um, so it means that way. But however, with this new opponent, she had to come into camp and taken the card so late that we just bumped it up to 120. So pretty much what they were pretty much implicating is that we could go anywhere between like 115, 121 um, straw weight. So we, we are, our weight class was a little bit different where she had accepted the fight so late that the officials were like, okay, we're going to let you guys just go try to meet at a 120 
uh, weight. So there was no set in stone 115 at that point. So we called it a straw weight. But yeah, yeah, we're light. We're light. I'm not a very big person. I'm only standing about five foot one. So. So you're five one and you fought between 115 and 120. So yeah, I actually uh, went in at 119. Interesting. Yeah. Pack, but but at 119 five one, you pack a lot of punch. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Actually, because I normally stand around uh, 125, 127 is my walking weight, which gotcha. is actually smaller. My uh, like I said too, going with the insulin pump and the CGM, I actually um, have lost weight. Because what was happening before, and I'm guilty of it, is when I was in middle school and I was taking, um, do you remember, like, what was it, regular and um, H&R? I'm trying to think of the different types of NPH and all these other ones. Anyway, I used to have to wait a half hour before I could eat. I don't know if you remember those kinds of insulins. Do you remember that? I did. Like where you'd have to take a shot and then you'd have to wait a half hour to 40 minutes before you could eat. I was, I think the, when I started taking insulin, I think that I was at a point with where I was able to eat, I, I, I was able to administer and eat. So I, you I, were, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cause that didn't come for me until about three years later from my first diagnosis. So anyway, so that being said, I was trained to almost take insulin and chase lows. Sure. So to speak. So I was actually heavier because what I had taught myself was I could eat whatever I wanted as long as I was low. Sure. Which is, and again, this is another <laughs> note for any, if there's any type one kids, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so not worth it. So anyways, I was actually heavier. Um, so yeah, so I went in there at 119 and that's actually the lowest weight. And it's amazing to me too, because we have to drop weight for weigh-ins. Um, and I had, and I dropped four and a half, five pounds within 90 minutes <laughs> and had to keep it off. And it, and people, and I could saw this look in my eyes <laughs> other than hunger. Um, but, uh, and it just reminded me so much of when I was first sick, it, it, it was amazing to me cause I was so thirsty and I was so hungry <laughs> and I just like kept thinking, people were like, what are you thinking about? And I just remember thinking about when I was a little kid, how sick being a, a newly diagnosed type one is how gross you feel. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't normally walk around at 119. This was actually a big weight cut for me. Um, but I did it in a very respectful cause, uh, like I said, I'm the first type one to enter the octagon in new England. So, so I had to, I wanted to make sure I did it right. Cause we had people like I had guys on the team cutting 12 pounds out in a day, like within 72 hours, they were just sweating it out and starving themselves. And I was like, my body can't do that. So I started a different approach about it. Yeah. I can't even imagine what your blood sugars would do if you just, if you tried to cut that much weight and a lot of the weight might be water, but at the same time you're not yeah. eating, as you said. Um, well, I actually went a total of, I think I went, I know I ate trying to think of what I ate because I had gone to almost an Atkins type diet with just like fresh almonds, spinach, and I'm a vegetarian. So I do a lot of tofu protein, okay. um, and things like that. But I had cut down and I switched my basil down to 20%. <laughs> wow. And, uh, my blood sugars actually never looked better with very little, little insulin. Very, I mean, I know it wasn't super healthy, but yeah. um, my blood sugars were great. They were fantastic. <laughs> Now, how did you uh, how did you feel um, it, it, not being on your normal regimen? How, how what was your your mind like? Because a lot of times when we're kind of our blood sugars are not where they normally are, we yeah. can get a little cloudy. Yeah, actually, like I said, um, I because I was doing the CGM and I was and I monitor when I because like right now I actually haven't had my CGM in for about five days because of insurance reasons and whatnot. So I'm waiting for my delivery, but um, I monitor like every once every two or three hours. Sure. Um, and it's amazing to me. My blood sugars are actually more intact because I have a tendency to, I don't want to say overeat. I'm like I said, I'm fairly, I'm, I'm very healthy. I'm a healthy person, but I do love carbs and I do love sweets. <laughs> and I know that like when I was first diagnosed, we had to follow a strict, strict diet. And I don't know if, like, since I got my pump in my CGM, I'm like, oh, right, I can do whatever I want. Um, but the dieting, because, I, like I said, I was eating just raw food. I was eating just vegetables. Um, and I was just drinking a ton of water and things like that. It actually, I felt great. Yeah, it's amazing I actually when, felt – It's amazing yeah. when we go to, like, a whole foods diet a lot of times where the food is just natural stuff that comes from the earth. 
um, yeah. how, how positively impactful that is for our blood sugars a lot of times. And it has less to do it's with the, the carbs per se, because everything has carbs in it. Everything. Um, you can't avoid everything carbs. from like sweet peppers. Yeah. Like, I mean, cause I, I incorporate a lot of peppers too, like, um, yellow and green and stuff like that. And things that people know are healthy. You don't realize that can even transition into sugar, like, especially at, like a banana, like, you know, there's like what, 34 grams of carbohydrates or give or take in one banana. People sure. don't realize what that can do. Like, and I'm talking about non-diabetics. Yeah. They just see fruit. So they think automatically healthy, but you don't, and it's a healthy sugar, but regardless, it's going to go with your glucose levels. No doubt. And, and look, the fiber always, always comes into play oh, yeah. with certain things too, which slows down the, the, the uh, uptake of the, of the, the glucose and the sugar, actually yeah. the sugar into our system. But yeah. And um, I also heard protein too, cause I've been following, um, diabetes, muscle and fitness on Instagram oh, and, um, the running, I think it's diabetes. I don't know if it's diabetic running or diabetic running podcast or something like that. These are two, um, one, two other of my favorite diabetic, um, Instagram sites, but they talk about how protein plays a huge part, I guess, in, um, your blood sugars and whatnot now too, which again, being diabetic for going on 25 years, it's just amazing to me to hear how these things change. You know what I mean? Like remember back in the nineties when, um, the complex carbs were in, and like everything was whole wheat and no fat. And then now it's like protein based and natural. And so it's just amazing to grow up in these times where you have to adjust your insulin and your diets based on, you know, what's popular and whatnot. Yeah. It's really interesting. Phil Graham, who's uh, diabetic muscle and fitness, he's over in the UK and he was actually on the show also. And Phil is yeah. a wealth. Uh, he's a treasure trove of knowledge. And, um, his, yeah, they opened up my eyes to protein. Like I said, like they, because of them, I was like, Oh my God. Cause they were saying, um, anyway, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, they opened up my eyes. Yeah, no, he, he's Phil, Phil's a, is a great resource. He knows what he's talking about. Um, some, I, when I was talking to Phil, he, he, and it, it as I said, he has so much information and there were so many myths that I came to the table with that he completely dispelled. And this is a guy who is a professional bodybuilder for years he's trained trainers all around the world uh, yeah so and he's type one too phil is yeah and yeah he, he's a big dude also he's not a little guy he's a big dude so it's amazing it's yeah. amazing to see what type ones are doing oh, yeah exactly exactly so is there is there um i have just a couple more questions for you and as yeah I no said, please I, like i said take your time as i said i knew i knew that i was going to come into this with more questions than i was going to have time for um so <laughs> What what is what does being resilient mean to you? What does being resilient? Yeah, mean what does to... the word resilient mean to you? Oh, I'm trying to think. Um, that's a hard one. I want to say to overcome, to um, prevail, to you know, to even though when you're given something, you overcome it is the best way to describe it. Like, I feel like my whole life has actually been overcoming resilience in some way or another, because I feel for most people, especially us type one diabetics, we always have a hurdle in front of us. And if we're able to, and this is just going to kind of go along with this. Each morning I wake up happy. Now my wife is not a morning person. (laughs) A lot of my teammates are not morning people, but I'm the really obnoxious person who's like, good morning. I love mornings. It's a new day. And the secret behind my morning happiness is because I'm just happy I woke up. And I know that seems a bit dramatic to say, but like you said with your CGM earlier, it helps you sleep because we don't know what could happen in the middle of the night with our bodies and we need these things. So I I just feel resilience for me is just overcoming life and living life to the fullest. You know what I mean? Because life is hard, but we can overcome it and make it the best we can. No doubt. Just kind of dovetailing on that 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 uh, concept of of waking up in the morning is gratitude something that that kind of helps to set you up for each day. Oh my God, absolutely! And I always tell myself this too is I always wonder what it would be like because I'm a very I believe in science and medicine and I believe in and yeah I'm a really big like sci-fi and entertainment person like I've talked about with my my uh, show references or music references. Like, I always wonder what it would be like for me to get in a time machine and go see 11-year-old BJ, like newly diagnosed BJ, you know, and be like, hey, this is what your life's going to be. And like show her my Instagram or to show her 
even my size now, like the health I'm in, because I can tell you at 11 years old, when I was diagnosed with diabetes sitting in that hospital bed, I never planned on living this long. I never, and, and to, I love my life. Like I have a beautiful wife. I have a great job. I have two beautiful fur bunnies. <laughs> I, I have rabbits at home. Um, Oh, and I have this opportunity to talk to people like you and other people around the world. So, yeah, every day I wake up and I'm just super grateful. And awesome. I, I don't know if it's due to the loss of things. Like I said, I never planned on living to be 35, let alone to see past my 20s. And, again, that's kind of the depression that goes with type 1 diabetes. But, yeah, I'm grateful every day, every yeah. day for my life. You're not only living, you're killing it. So <laughs> Yeah, I love it. And I said, well, it's amazing because I always wondered and I – and I want to give a shout out to like Nick Jonas too, who was in the show Kingdom, which is an MMA show, um, and he's a like the world's most popular type one, uh, sure. right behind Mary Tyler Moore, who always who will always be my number one type one girl. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's just amazing because when I was first diagnosed, and I'm going back to the '90s, the world was so different, and I had no idea there were so many more of us out there. You know what I mean? And I just never realized the capability of the things we could do. Or the technology that would eventually come. Which people I've been called um, not to be mixed up with the MMA fighter cyborg. She's amazing, but um, you know I'm half machine now. I like I have something plugged into me at all times. So I'm just very grateful for the way science has come, whether it be through social media, from you and I even having this conversation today. Yeah. Just it's blown. It's, it's such a huge impact for type one diabetics, including myself. So. So I'm just very, very grateful for that. And I know that if I was 11 or a kid these days, like even when I talk to kids who are newly diagnosed, because I do that around the area, you know, it's just mind blowing to me is that they don't have to, like I was talking about the insulin I took or like when I was, I remember being in sixth grade because I was on the basketball team. I used to have to carry around a carbohydrate and nutritional book with me on away trips if we stopped at McDonald's and I would have to read the chapter on how many carbohydrates a hamburger was. And then try to time my shot so I could eat with the team. And then, God forbid, our food came out early and my insulin was only 15 minutes active. I had to sit around and watch my teammates eat and get mine to go and eat on the bus by myself. Mm. You know what I mean? And now here I am with an insulin pump. And you wouldn't even know anything was wrong with me. Um, I wear scrubs at the hospital and people think I'm a doctor. <laughs> they think my insulin pump's a pager, so it's perfect. <laughs> do they still have pagers? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they do. It's interesting because I, when, when I worked up at Columbia, I had a pager, and this was actually before uh, before cell phones. It was right before cell phones were yeah. kind of very popular and starting to kind of hit mainstream. Yeah. And uh, I remember getting pages and having to find a landline and return yeah. the calls. <laughs> so oh, yeah. That's amazing oh, yeah, no, that they, they still, still exist. Them. That's so funny. Yep, they do. Yep, they still have them, um, especially for like on call or things like that. Or, you know, yeah. And plus, it's probably easier just to wear in a hip than a cell phone, I feel like. That's so funny. Yeah, my, my insulin pump looks great with my scrubs. <laughs> it probably looks a little more sophisticated than your pager. So yeah, right. Yeah, that's so great. funny. Do you yeah. have a Do you have a a, a book uh, or that kind of has recently made a huge impact on you? Any books? Um, actually, The Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, um, I watched the show on Hulu. Have you heard of it? I have not actually. And it's actually about. It was written back in the 80s, and it's more towards the empowerment of women and whatnot and government throwdown and whatnot. But I um, decided to pick up the book after I watched it. It's actually won um, a lot of awards, too, Golden Globe Awards and whatnot. Um, yeah, and it just talks about how easily our government can control us and primarily going back to the basics of early civilization. And I mean more like biblical times, like what the role of a woman is. And so forth. So, so I, I picked that book up, um, and I recommend it for any for any ladies out there, anybody uh, looking. It's it's a brutal, it's a brutal, brutally honest book. <laughs> Love it. I'll definitely have a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, as well. yeah, or at least check out the show. It's on Hulu. Um, and I was a big fan of Mad Men. It has a a, a young lady who uh, starred in Mad Men in it. So it's a great show. I'll definitely Good book link too. To that. Excellent. So before we finish up here, where can everyone? find you online what's coming up next for you um we're actually in the talks because i said i was going to fight once uh but we're actually talking about hopefully finishing the year out with another fight <laughs> uh, in the octagon yeah yeah and i'm going to be doing a jujitsu tournament um in new hampshire 
with uh, my team back in April. And it's cool because we have some younger kids. Our gym's just blowing up now. And I, you know, from these fights and the attentions getting, our gym's getting a lot of uh, attention because we uh, help support people, especially people like me with diabetes and and stuff like that. So um, it's cool because we have kids now on our team. Like we have a lot of these the next generation, we call them. So then do some jujitsu. Going to do um, some more fighting. Looking to start up um, maybe doing some web, uh, more stuff online, sell some more shirts. Um, I was talking to a company, and they're doing type 1 diabetes rash guards and things like that. So, sure. yeah, so hopefully going to be working with some more people in the type 1 diabetes community around um, promoting just what we can do to just empower uh, people to be better than their disease. So, so I'm going to be all over the place. Hopefully I'm awesome. still online. So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Sounds good. And I'll have those links yeah. in the show notes as well. Yeah. So, awesome. So, BJ, look, I really appreciate your time today. I, I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing. Cause you're, you're really showing not only type ones, but everyone that anything is possible despite massive challenges that we face through, throughout the course of our lives. But then we also have the ability to take those challenges and put them into perspective. And we realize that what we might be going through might be not as great as what other people might be going through. And exactly. that helps us to succeed and kind of thrive and ultimately overcome uh, even more so. So thank you very much for everything you're well, doing. Well, thank wish... you very much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, this is probably the first of a couple of conversations we'll have. And I'll, I'll be make sure, again, to... Uh, Everyone, I want to want to make sure everybody's following you online because they can then see where you're fighting next and what's coming up for you, and then also with some of the apparel and the, and the gear that you're working on too. Yeah, we, we have to support everyone in that community, the Type One community. So, yeah, anything I can do for you guys or anyone else there, feel free to email me, message me, or whatnot. Anything I can do to uh, to show my support and encouragement to others, I'm here for you. Sounds awesome. Hold on after I, I stop record here because I just want to share one more thing with you before I let you go. Yeah, okay? please do. Okay, All right. great. All right, we'll talk soon. Hold on one second. Okay. All right, guys, I hope you got a lot out of that conversation with BJ. I love BJ's spirit and how she continues to put challenge in front of herself and simply not make any excuses. I'll have everything that we talked about on this episode linked up in the show notes, which you can find at thebravestlife.com forward slash 037. And finally, you guys know how important reviews are on iTunes. And when you share your thoughts about the show on iTunes, it simply makes it a whole lot easier for the world to find us. So if you haven't done so already, and if you like the show, please consider heading over to iTunes and leave your own review. It really just takes a minute or two, so please let the world know what you think of the show. All right, guys, thanks for joining me again this week as we continue on our path to develop a blueprint for a life without any excuses. I'm Craig, and I will see you next week. Take care, guys.